Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Autumn 2020, 2021 Lecture Series of the Virtual Museum Lecture Series presented by the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. Our, our community is filled with diverse stories, and we recognize that our story begins with the Indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are broadcasting tonight's lecture on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia, and we would like to honor the centuries of Indigenous peoples who walked on Turtle Island before us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Adrian Petrie. I'm the Visitor Services Coordinator here at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. Welcome back to the lecture series. Um, we hope these lectures provide a bit of historical joy and also spark imagination and exploration of our city's rich history. If you're joining us for the first time, why not go back and view all the other lectures that have, been, that have been presented in the last year. There are now 28 lectures, tonight is 29, believe it or not, uh, for you to enjoy. Uh, so look at all the catching up you have to do. <laughs> Just look for the playlist Virtual Museum Lecture Series on our YouTube channel. We are also happy to uh, announce that the lecture audio is being added to our podcast. VMLS via podcast will help to share the lectures with an even wider audience. So if you're new, again, you have lots of catching up to do, you can catch up via podcast. Or if you want to go back and listen to your favorite lecture again, it'll be there waiting for you in the coming weeks. As we dive into some exciting history tonight, please feel free to make use of the chat box, which I see many are. Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, to uh, feel free to ask questions and send comments. We'll moderate them during and at the end of the presentation. There is a slight delay in the, in the broadcast, though. So if we do miss a question, uh, we will get to it at the end of the presentation. Can you believe we only have one lecture left after tonight's presentation in the fall 2021 series of the lecture series? This is very exciting. Let me tell you about it. On November 30th, Kathleen Powell, our curator and visitor um, supervisor, that's me, supervisor of historical services, will explore when the world was plunged into war in 1914 and how everything changed. Life would never be the same for those who fought and for those who were left behind. This lecture is a personal look at the First World War through the eyes and voices of those who lived through this life-changing moment in time. We know you love the lecture series, so never fear. We will be back in February. I'm excited to share the dates for our winter 2022 lecture series with you. Please mark your calendars. We will, oops, we will announce the lecture topics and lectures during the lecture uh, on November 30th. We have our guests lined up, and so we're basically ready, but of course we're going to hold off until the last lecture of the series. So yay, I hope everyone is excited. I'd like to take a moment to encourage you to make a donation to the museum in support of our programming. Your donations help us to continue to provide the high quality and enjoyable programming that you have come to expect from us. We really appreciate any donation you're able to make. Give us a call at 905-984-8880 during our operating hours to make a donation. And new this fall, you can now make a donation online via our ActiveNet portal. The link to the portal was included in our email reminder this evening. Your donation makes a difference. Thank you. And now, I am thrilled and very happy to hand it over to our public programmer, Sarah Nixon, who will tonight deliver a really interesting talk. I know because I've read it. <laughs> I got the preview. Um, really interesting talk about the important influences and trends that have led housing development in our city. So let's, actually, I'm not going to take that pun away from you, Sarah. I will just let you have your pun and hand it right over. <laughs> That's awesome, Adrian. Thank you so much. I believe the pun has something to do with rolling up your sleeves and getting to work. <laughs> so let's do exactly that. I am going to share my screen and bring up the lovely slide presentation I have for you here. 
and we will get going. Okay. Most of us live somewhere. So I invite you to take part in a thought exercise to begin tonight's talk. Think about where you live currently. What brought you to where you now call home? What about your neighborhood, even your town or city? These questions have always fascinated me. Home is a universal concept that each of us understands and connects with on a personal level. Yet, though we all live somewhere, each of our living conditions and circumstances vary wildly. Tonight's lecture was inspired by a series of photographs in the museum collection taken by the St. Catherine Standard photographer in 1941 for the Department of Health. The description accompanying the photo series reads, quote, shacks in the Facer Street District. Seeing such poor living conditions in St. Catharines was striking. It was a stark reminder of the privilege and standard of living we expect from life in this city. Yet at the same time, these images are not unlike the tent cities we have driven by or have seen in the news. Who lived in these homes? What circumstances had brought them to this point? Unfortunately, the demographic of people who lived in these homes in 1941 were not likely to leave extensive historical record. Trends tell us that usually non-English immigrants use such temporary structures and people living in those conditions were less likely to document their lives, left without a voice due to a variety of difficult barriers, language, lack of social support, discrimination. But we can learn from the historical context and trends that might have led to living situations like these. Tracing housing trends in St. Catharines over the decades can reveal how larger societal shifts in class relations, immigration, and technology shaped the way people lived here in the city. So in tonight's lecture, I will examine specific case studies of urban development in St. Catharines history as a lens to consider larger social trends that impacted Canada on a more broadly in the 19th and 20th centuries. Before I go further, I must preface that this is in no way a comprehensive story. The case studies I share are only one or are, are, are only a few of many examples, each with their own nuances. And I'm sure that those tuning in tonight will be able to add a few more examples to this list. Okay. Now that I've strung up my caution tape around this construction project, let's get to work. Every good developer and planner should know the importance of impact assessments and studies. Land use studies, environmental impact assessments, heritage impact assessments, urban transportation assessments, there are now a million studies when it comes to development. So what did assessments did early settlers make when, or what, so what assessments did early settlers make that would eventually shape what St. Catharines looked like now in 2021? Development patterns of early settlers in Niagara in the late 1700s were largely shaped by geography and natural landscape, access to water and good quality soil for farming. The land forming what is now St. Catharines, Grantham Township at the time was formally surveyed in 1788. Fronting onto Lake Ontario, the township met the lake shore at a northeast angle. By running the concession roads parallel to the lake shore, the surveyors were able to maximize the number of lots on the land. As a result, the farm lots were shaped like parallelograms. The township was initially surveyed to be 23 farm lots wide containing 10 concessions. 
Today, we know some of these concession roads as Linwell Road, Scott Street, Carlton Street, and Welland Avenue, to name a few. European settlement at St. Catharines emerged in the 1790s, converging around the height of land where Dix Creek and 12 Mile Creek met. This became a community separate from Grantham Township. Settlers were drawn to this location thanks to the existing confluence of the many trails crisscrossing Niagara, many made by generations of indigenous peoples who lived, traded, and traveled through the area, as well as the fertile lands that surrounded the waterway and the potential of the creek to provide water power for mills. Settlers to the area built, first built a storehouse as a supply and trading point about where Burgoyne Bridge is today. And this was followed by mills, then a church, a tavern, a school, and eventually shops and stores. The settlement remained very small until about the 1820s when construction of the first Welland Canal generated significant growth to the area. By the 1830s, the area bounded by the Welland Canal in the south and west, by Welland Avenue in the north, and Page Street in the east was mostly settled with St. Catherine's earliest residents. The outlying area surrounding these boundaries are all Grantham Township. Now this map dated to 1836 and drawn by Robert Mangy was, is considered to be the first map of St. Catharines as a whole. And it is clear from the map just how influential the canal was to the early shaping and settlement patterns of St. Catharines. Not only did the canal seem to draw settlement and development, in that density seems to increase the closer to the canal, but its valley where the 12 mile creek converged with the canal proved to be a physical barrier to development on the south side. That geography and natural landscape shaped the early settlement patterns of St. Catharines is important. They are the very bones, the foundations of the city. Development is ongoing and it's ever changing. Though we have this 1836 map of St. Catharines, very few, if any, structures built from that area that from that era still stand today. But the bones remain. The valley of 12 Mile Creek, the shores of Lake Ontario, the steep incline of the Niagara Escarpment. Indigenous made trails and 18th century concession roads continue to form the main arteries of the city. The downtown core where European settlers first dug roots continues to beat as the city's heart. As time persists into the 20th and even 21st centuries, we see how technological advancements and other trends have changed St. Catherine's relationship with these physical foundations. And this brings me to my first case study, the impact of industrialization. The first industrial revolution is largely characterized by the shift from a largely agricultural and extractive economy to one that engaged in manufacturing, as well as by embracing new transportation technologies. In St. Catharines, the development of the Welland Canal was integral to the community's early industrialization. The canal not only significantly expanded the transportation of goods, but also increased water power to the various mills set up along the canal, thus also increasing production. By the 1850s, St. Catharines was a hub of industrial activity with reaches in a vast number of economic sectors, including brewing, textiles, milling, and shipbuilding. I've circled a few of these industries operating along the canal in St. Catharines at the time of the making of this 1853 map. They include a woolen factory, a tannery, a foundry, numerous mills, a dry dock, shipyard, brewery, distillery, and salt works. And in addition to these manufacturing businesses, a number of important secondary and tertiary industries were also operating in St. Catharines to support them, like banks, shops, hotels, carriage makers, and tool makers. 
With early industrialization emerged a new capitalist class who quickly rose to form their own elite circles. The landowners began the industrial the landowners became the industrial entrepreneurs, and they used their influence to enter politics, lead fraternal organizations, join various boards of commerce and public works, and have their hand in shaping the growth of their community. For some industrialists, their rise to the capitalist class happened quite quickly, and for others, it took a generation or two. But shaping their community was played as a long game. For many members of the capitalist class, as well as for the growing industrial working class they employed, the entirety of their lives was situated within the urban boundaries of where they lived. Work, church, school, market, the tavern, the homes of those within their social circle, with only some exception. And at this time, constraints of poor roads and slow transportation meant that both industrialists and the working classes tended to live where they worked. In St. Catharines, this played out in a few different ways over time. The Yates Street District, situated above the steep bluffs of the 12 Mile Creek and the Welland Canal where they merged, this area grew to become a stately neighborhood of elegant homes over the course of several decades. The homes that still stand today range in date from about the 1850s to the early 1900s. And many of these homes were built by the capitalists who operated their industries on the banks of the canal below or had established prominent businesses a few streets over in the urban core. Here's a close up of the Yates Street district on my 1852 map. Now, of course, one of the most notable Yates Street residents is the Honorable William Hamilton Merritt, who built Oak Hill at 12 Yates Street. Both Thomas B. Bate and James Taylor of Taylor and Bate Brewery which operated directly below Yates Street, constructed their homes on Yates Street in the 1850s. And a number of their descendants continued the tradition and built or purchased homes in the neighborhood in later years. Now let's quickly compare maps of St. Catharines to see how Yates Street developed and grew over time to match the urban growth of the center. Here we have our, our 1836 map where we see some lots plotted out, lots of open space still around the downtown. We shift to 1852 here where we have some buildings, the lots are getting smaller, uh, the lots and the homes more dense. And again, by 1875, we see a lot more ho homes not only populating Yates Street, but we see a lot more industry and factories along the canal, um, but also in the urban center as well. Another example is Louis Shakluna and his shipyard. Seemingly one to carve out his own path, Shakluna constructed his shipyard on the other side of the canal, where he also lived. Shakluna's shipyard was a massive enterprise at its peak employing over 300 workers in the 1850s. Not only had Shakluna made a residence, his residence close to the shipyard, but his workers did too. As more workers settled in the area, a small commercial center emerged to serve the community and the Western Hill neighborhood was founded. This 1876 map of St. Catharines clearly shows in the bottom left corner here um, how Western Hill grew around the industry operating along the banks of the canal. We also see in this map how the expansion of Western Hill was also shaped by the railroad that cut through the neighborhood. 
the invention of steam technology and the construction of the railroad greatly escalated industrialization by the mid 1850s. Often the story of the emergence of the railway in Canadian history is one of growth, expansion and connection as the distance between goods, materials and people in faraway places was suddenly collapsed and made more easily accessible. However, in St. Catharines, the story of the railroad is rather one of missed opportunity. The Great Western Railway connecting the Detroit River to the Niagara River was completed in 1853. Regular service eventually expanded to Toronto in 1855, Montreal in 1856, and into Buffalo, Boston, New York, and the Midwest after the completion of the suspension bridge over Niagara Gorge. All good things, opening lots of opportunity to expand business and trade development. However, the bones of St. Catharines proved to be a significant barrier to such opportunity. Due to, and I'm quoting a source from 1881, the heavy intervening obstacle of the deep valley of the old Welland Canal, end quote, promoters of the railway chose to build St. Catherine's new station at Western Hill, away from the urban core and on the other side of the canal, and thus made, quote, the greatest mistake in the annals of St. Catherine's, end quote. The consequence was that St. Catharines, the principal community in Niagara, was effectively bypassed by the railroad. At the time, the station was located some distance away from the developed business and residential areas of the urban core in downtown St. Catharines. Reaching it meant that reaching the station from downtown meant taking a wagon or a horse-drawn omnibus and struggling up and down the steep slopes of 12 Mile Creek, then facing the possible delays while slow moving ships passed through the canal. Instead of becoming a rail center like Hamilton or Toronto, St. Catharines remained just a stop on the tracks. Here's a, a closer look of Western Hill and the location of the, the Great Western Railway grounds here. It was very unusual for such a major urban center to be so purposefully isolated in such a period of railway promotion and expansion. However, the chosen location of the rail station did stimulate the further development of Western Hill. New industries began to grow around the railroad and more housing for workers followed suit. As it had in urban centers across Canada, the industrialization of St. Catharines greatly shaped early settlement patterns. Industries were established close to transportation routes like the canal and the railroad, and both capitalists and their workers set up their homes close by. The emergence of St. Catherine's earliest neighborhoods then had direct ties to the industries that were built here, weaving around the natural landscape of the area. It's worth considering how the legacy of industrialism continues to shape the development of St. Catherine's and Canada today. The brownfield sites that sprinkle urban centers, once burgeoning sites of industry and opportunity, are now at the center of a developmental po policies at all levels of government. And furthermore, where these brownfield sites are situated in the city continue to influence the demographics of people who live around them. In May of 1913, the following advertisement was published in the St. Catharines Standard. It was a promotion for the new development of Glen Ridge, the area separated by the city center by 
separated from, from the city center by the deep valley of the old canal, was viewed as too challenging to develop and remained quiet farmland until the construction of a high level bridge promised to extend Ontario Street across the valley and foster growth and expansion. Calling the bridge and subsequent opening up of Glen Ridge as one of, quote, the greatest steps forward in the history of St. Catharines, the advertisement promised that Glen Ridge St. Catharines' most favored resident section would quote, be the home of the best people in the Niagara Peninsula, the home of the influential citizens of five industrial centers, end quote. The ad also claimed that anyone could build their home in Glenridge, quote, the successful businessman, the man of money, and the thrifty worker, end quote. However, there was one prerequisite to building your home in this idyllic neighborhood. And this wasn't as explicitly stated in the ad. Owning a automobile. The high level bridge built to connect Glen Ridge to the city center was designed for vehicular traffic, not train or streetcar, but automobile. Interest in building this bridge only arose as more of St. Catherine's wealthy citizens acquired autom automobiles of their own and they sought to leave the urban core. The Glen Ridge neighborhood was expressly designed to accommodate the automobile. The main thoroughfare roads were graded to be 24 feet wide and homes were built along winding driveways as these were thought to be, quote, the most attractive for the automobile, automobilist and the man who enjoys fine scenery. Located some distance away from the urban core and not on a streetcar route, this, quote, exclusive residential section of the city, unquote, was inaccessible to the working class. Many workers wouldn't be able to afford a car until after the, eight, the, after the Second World War in the, eight, in the 1950s. So the thrifty worker opted to live within walking distance of their place of employment out of necessity. However, the Glen Ridge neighborhood was carefully planned to be surrounded by manicured greenery and parkland, not industry. In fact, the 1913 advertisement explicitly states that Glen Ridge is quote, the only properly restricted area where in the build, the home builder has ample protection without being forced to excessive investment, end quote. Glen Ridge was an exclusive planned suburb for the professional class. By design, certain demographics were not welcome. The development of Glen Ridge is part of a larger story of the beginning of suburban planning or suburbanization in Canada and the United States just after the turn of the 20th century and into the 1920s. The impetus for the exodus to the suburbs had several factors. Rapid population increase in urban cores as more immigrants and folks from rural communities found work in factories, imposed a demand for more housing and stimulating the exodus of wealthier families, a renewed value in the novelty of green space and parklands, the proliferation of leisure and recreation as the mechanization of household appliances enabled families who could afford them, to spend more time together. And lastly, as we've already discussed, the advent of the automobile, which made further commutes more accessible, again, only for those who could afford it. Glen Ridge epitomizes these above trends. This 1913 standard ad acknowledges that housing demands in St. Catharines would be supplied by building hundreds of homes in the neighborhood, and that, quote, every development taking place in Thorold, Meriton, 
Port Dalhousie, Port Colburn, and St. Catharines itself will have a direct effort effect in the city and will create a continuous demand for first class residence property, end quote. Planned strictly as a residential neighborhood, in its very initial conceptions, Glenridge was designed to be the most exclusive residence section of the city, another quote. Advertisements state that thousands of dollars were spent in the grading of roads, laying of concrete sidewalks, their surveying and landscaping gardening of residential parklands, where trees were planted equidistant on either side and park reserves established along the banks of the old canal for residents to enjoy. This is unlike the development we see in the Yates Street District. There, the neighborhood had evolved over several decades, and as St. Catharines industrialized and its capitalist class grew and their wealth increased. Glenridge neighborhood, on the other hand, was a result of a refined and carefully studied comprehensive plan. This 1913 map of Glenridge was in fact drawn when the neighborhood was still in its planning phase, when surveyors and engineers were still grading the land and roadways. However, the neighborhood that results over years of construction actually play out to be very similar to this original plan. We see this is a screenshot taken on the Brock University maps data and GIS website overlaying the 1913 plan onto a current map of St. Catharines. And we see that the layout is almost identical to what the plan was in 1913. Now, planned, suburb, planned suburban neighborhoods of the early 1900s drew from the progressive ideals that urban planning could effect social reform. These include the work of the City Beautiful Movement and Ebenezer Howard's concept of the Garden City in England. Howard published Garden Cities of Tomorrow in 1902, although it was first published in, 19, in 1898 under a different title. Now, Garden Cities of Tomorrow was considered the English manifesto that used urban planning as a path to social reform and to tame the evils of capitalism and industrialism. Howard proposed a new approach to community design, which he'd called the Garden City. This was to offer an attractive, almost romantic vision of housing at a far lower density than the industrial city and in far greater visual and ecological harmony with the surrounding natural landscape. The Garden City was also to be a solution to the so-called land question as industrialization of society intensified, roughly speaking, the conjoined phenomena of the overcrowding of towns and cities and the supposed rural exodus. In Howard's vision of the social city, in which we see in this very, very detailed and ornate design, the central city, which is the core of industry and production, is surrounded by distinct residential communities where workers would live and raise their families. Each of these garden cities would be surrounded by farmland, green space, natural forests, and water reservoirs. Now, it is worth noting here that I have not been able to confirm as to whether Howard's work inspired St. Catherine's nickname of the Garden City. Some sources date this nickname back to the mid-1850s, and Howard came up with this concept in at the turn of the 20th century. Elements of Howard's Garden City are very similar to the core values of the City Beautiful movement that emerged in the United States and Canada in the 1890s. The movement focused on urban planning efforts to beautify rapidly industrializing cities through architectural harmony, unified design, and visual aesthetic. 
City Beautiful was a response to the negative impacts of industrialization and urbanization, namely overcrowding and reduced living conditions as an influx of people migrated to city centers for employment opportunities, rising pollution as manufacturing increased and erecting tower towering utility poles that blemished the streets. The City Beautiful movement centered around the idea that efforts of urban beautification, elegant parks and gardens, recreational waterways, spacious public plazas would enhance a city as an ideal utopia, which in turn would improve the moral and social characters of its citizens. Under City Beautiful, citizens were seen to value, respect, and keep their surroundings beautiful and tidy, and therefore, and therefore more modern and socially refined. To beautify the urban environment as a whole was socially beneficial, improving the lives of the citizens who lived there. We see these ideals influence this, this plan of the future Glen Ridge neighborhood. The green space that surrounds the residential area to the north and west, including the St. Catharines Golf and Country Club to the east. Now let's compare these plans to the rest of St. Catharines in this 1923 fire insurance plan. We see Glen Ridge here is kind of in the the bottom center, I hope you can see my mouse circling. Um, we can see that Glen Ridge here, uh, the streets are much more meandering, the properties are more spacious than in the urban core, which we see a number two, three, four kind of area. Now, if we return to the 1913 plans, the visual paradigm of a quasi pastoral setting of lawns, trees, and winding streets reflect the importance of leisure to the professional class looking to relocate away from St. Catherine's urban center. A closer look at the streetscape also reveals elements of the city beautiful design. If you look to the top left corner of the map, we have a drawing of what the streets of Glen Ridge were to look like. We have a nice even road with equidistant sidewalks that are very evenly spaced, equidistant trees right on the other side of the sidewalks, then a little bit of yard, and then the beautiful house. So we see again this unified streetscape, and this was supposed to enact elements of both uh, City Beautiful with the unified design and the urban beauty, as well as the garden city approach where the community of Glen Ridge is located away from the urban core. The homes built on the lots of Glen Ridge were also of a certain aesthetic that drew on a romantic view of nature. The arts and craft archite architectural style, which emphasized handicraft work, natural light and natural elements in the facade, as well as in the interior, wood, brick and stone. And of course, let's not forget that these lots were planned out to be wide enough, not only for a roomy home, but a driveway for the automobile the homeowners would inevitably need. I'm going to go to this slide, yes. Now I want to return to Western Hill for a moment because the promises being made in Glen Ridge in 1913 were vastly different than those in the working class community across 12 Mile Creek in Western Hill. The emergence of the suburbanization trends that fostered the development of Glen Ridge also shaped Western Hill, but in a different way. The same sentiments arising at the turn of the 20th century that saw crowded urban cores as a detriment to health, well being, and morality also encouraged the outward movement of factories. 
While this is a trend we see across Canada and the United States at this time, the story of St. Catharines is particularly unique in that factories were not only prompted to move away from the downtown core due to these ideas of social reform, but also for the more, but also for more practical reasons. The route of the Third Bowen Canal, which opened in 1887, was relocated away from the urban core. And the industries along the now old canal considered relocating as a result to cheaper land, more open space. So in May of 1913, the same month that advertisers, were, that advertisers were promoting Glen Ridge as the future home of, quote, the best people of the Niagara Peninsula, end quote, supplying the demand for, quote, first class residence property, end quote, in the St. Catherine Standard, advertisers were also promoting Western Hill as simultaneously as the place to develop both industry and housing. Workers could live where they worked. Published by the Mahaffey Brothers, the ad vehemently claims, quote, West St. Catharines has miles and miles of level land without a bridge to cross. Here, the great city water mains extend out to connect to the, with the reservoir. Here, the natural gas mains first reach the city. Here is the great cataract electric plant with nearly 100,000 horsepower. Here is the fast double track main line of the Grand Trunk Railway and acres and acres of dry level, low priced land for industries. Here, the city can expand for the least cost. Here are the cheap lots builders must have. From now on, West St. Catharines will participate largely in the city's advancement. Factories will build along the railway. Hundreds of houses will be needed in this district. Here is located on Lincoln Avenue and both sides of Pelham Road, 15 minute walk from the post office, natural gas, city water, electric light, phones, school, now on the property. What do you notice about this advertisement for the Western Hill development compared to that of Glenridge? Rather than promoting exclusivity, the ad promotes convenience. This here, I should say, is a map of a close up of the fire insurance plan of Glen Ridge in 1923. So, comparing Western Hill to Glen Ridge, rather than promoting exclusivity, the ad promotes convenience. Instead of emphasizing landscape gardening and park res reserves, the ad emphasizes opportunity for industrial development. Valued amenities here are access to electricity, water, natural gas, not winding roads for the recreational driver to enjoy the scenery. And here we have the same 1923 fire insurance plan with a close up of Western Hill. Instead of being planned as an idyllic, picturesque suburb where the professional class could escape the bustle and crowding and grime of the city center, new developments in Western Hill were planned for functionality and efficiency. The streets were straighter and shorter. The homes smaller and made out of wood frame. The neighborhood was intermixed with industry and lined both sides of the railway. And furthermore, the creation of new jobs was meant to draw workers to settle in this new development. It is also notable that the advertisement for Western Hill repeats the low cost of investment. $139 for a lot size 35 by 105 feet and the requirement of a $5 deposit for each lot. 
There is no mention of sale prices or deposits for the lots in Glen Ridge, though the sale managers do offer to take prospective buyers to the property. Is this, is it just assumed that finances are not a concern for the class of people that Glen Ridge has, was being developed for? This advertisement raised a few questions for me that I wasn't quite able to answer. Were the costs listed for the Homeland Sun Division in Western Hill meant to deter some workers and their family? Or would an advertisement like this have been a sign of relief to the working class family that housing was within their reach? It's also not quite clear to me as it stands who this advertisement was speaking to. Yes, the working class who would find employment at nearby factories, but were ethnicity or religion barriers to who could own a home in Western Hill? Consider for a moment what your neighborhood looked like when you were growing up or looks like today. What influence does this have on the community? Okay, let's move on to my next case study. This fast forwards a few decades through time to the Second World War. Of all the vast architectural styles and designs of residential housing here in Canada, I think it's safe to say that the one we all can immediately identify is the Victory Home or the wartime house. These compact one or one and a half story homes, which have also been referred to as strawberry box houses for their shape, were erected by Wartime Housing Limited as a temporary solution to the increasing housing shortage felt in industrial towns and cities across Canada during the Second World War. The National Film Board produced a short documentary entitled Wartime Housing in 1943 that does a fantastic job outlining the efforts made to build decent housing for workers in urban centers during the war. The documentary is about 18 minutes long and I highly, highly recommend you give it a watch. Hopefully we'll be able to add the link to the documentary in the YouTube comments. Now the housing shortage in Canada was already acute at the start of the war in 1939, and the need for a solution became only more urgent as workers migrated to industrial urban centers to work at one of the many factories producing munitions or other goods for the war effort. Industrial cities like St. Catharines were threatening to burst with the influx of, quote, the army in overalls, end quote, who had no choice but to live in working class sums, working class slums, rather, uh, that were already overcrowded, unsanitary, and unhealthy. The impetus to build new housing was that such poor living conditions quickly began to impact work productivity at these factories. Labor had a high turnover as workers moved from city to city looking for a better place to work, to live. And the quote, lack of air, good sleep and exercise, end quote, as put by the National Film Board doc, um, this began to affect work efficiency and quality. And the public sentiment before the public sentiment towards the quality of housing given to Canada's industrial army is adequately expressed in this in another statement from the NFB. Quote, the wrong side of the tracks is not good enough for the workers fighting a people's war. End quote. In response to the housing shortage felt across Canada at this time, the federal government established Wartime Housing Limited in 1941. In the time before the Second World War, the government did not provide the social safety net that we've grown accustomed to today. A government-funded program to create housing was very novel at this time. 
Again, despite there being increasing housing shortage in Canada in the years leading up to the war, the government only took an interventionist approach to housing when the shortage threatened to impact wartime production. The express purpose of wartime housing was to build vast temporary housing in Canada's industrial centers, providing adequate living conditions for industrial workers and thus halting labor turnover and increasing wartime productivity. A key aspect of this was to select sites in close proximity to factories for the housing projects. With the priority still to direct much as much production and materials as possible towards the war effort, architects were to design inexpensive homes of non-essential materials that could be erected in less than 36 hours. With the workforce at a premium, large-scale machinery like bulldozers and backhoes were utilized whenever possible during the construction in an effort to minimize the number of workers being taken away from the war effort. Walls, doors, and windows were prefabricated in mills before being shipped to construction sites, and the houses were erected with crews, um, who worked in quasi-assembly lines. Some projects would have, would have had about 20 crews or more erecting whole neighborhoods of 200, 500, and even 1,000 homes in some cities. The construction of mass scale housing was a whole new approach to building with value placed on efficiency and affordability above all else. In St. Catharines, wartime housing projects began in earnest right away in 1941. Take a sip of water here. 1941. This is where the story of the photographs that, in, that inspired my research into this topic pick back up. 1941 was the same year the Department of Health visited the Shack neighborhood around Facer Street. While it's hard to say whether the influx of workers migrating to St. Catharines to work in wartime production led to the erection of the shacks, it seems that they were raised to be replaced with new prefabricated housing. This, at least, is my interpretation from these photos in the same series, where we see stacks of freshly new or fresh, newly fabricated wooden frames that look entirely out of place against the dilapidated buildings of the slum. According to the wartime housing documentary, surveyors with Wartime Housing Limited either selected desirable outlying land close to factories for building these communities or raised slums to replace housing for the workers who lived there. Unfortunately, I don't know for certain exactly where this shanty town in the Facer Street District was, how many homes in the area it consisted of, who lived there, and what brought them there. It's important to note that historically, Facer Street has been primarily an immigrant community since the 1870s. The neighborhood was first home to mostly Italian immigrants and later welcomed immigrant families from other non-English speaking European countries like Poland and the Ukraine. Though many in this community found work, whether in manufacturing, construction, agriculture, or operating their own business, it must be considered whether ethnic discrimination or class issues enabled such poor housing conditions to fester here. Perhaps not Surprisingly, the St. Catherine Standard was not so interested in what came before the construction of these new shiny wartime housing projects. 
the news the newspaper was more concerned with documenting I'm sorry, rather, the newspaper was more concerned with documenting the mass scale of the projects coming into St. Catharines and the optimistic opportunities that the new housing provided. About 325 homes would be built in various neighborhoods in St. Catharines, all close by to major manufacturing facilities. One of the largest of these neighborhoods was the Victoria Park subdivision, where 133 single family homes were built explicitly for munition workers in the area, quote, just north of Carlton Street near Hank, end quote. These homes were more than likely, or these homes rather more than likely served the McKinnon Industries plant on Ontario Street, which had redirected its energies towards munitions during the war. Here we can see the neat grid of the new subdivision on the 1943 St. Catharines fire insurance plan. The homes are identical in shape and size and laid out on identical lots. Further confirmation that these wartime houses, that these are wartime houses, is their yellow coloring on the map, meaning they were built out of wood frame. I'll go back to this slide just to give a, a better look at the uniformity of this neighborhood. The yellow, meaning wood frame, compared to the pink, which meant that the building uh, was made out of brick construction. Now, I was able to use the 1943 fire insurance plans to map Victoria Park in relation to McKinnon Industries that we see here on, on this slide. In line with Wartime Housing Limited Protocol, the subdivision was built on the outskirts of the St. Catherine City Center, actually right on the, Township Town, the Grantham Township boundary, and in very close proximity to the largest munitions plant in St. Catharines at the time of the war. Another 109 homes were built in the Queen Elizabeth Park area near, quote, the eastern end of Welland Avenue, end quote, towards Grantham Avenue, which was another industrial hub in the city. Again, we see uh, Queen Elizabeth Park on the map, the houses evenly spaced apart, very similar in shape, made out of wood, but the roads are a little bit more windy on, uh, on this plan. Now, we see using the maps, I was able to line up the fire insurance plans again um, to show that Again, this development, Queen Elizabeth Park, uh, was strategically built in proximity to large production plants like Imperial, Imperial Iron Corporation, St. Catherine Steel Products, which was labeled as a shell plant on this map, and the Canadian Yale and Town Lock Factory. Oh, I have a little... Look at that, I've circled, oh, I circled some of the industries in relation to, uh, to the development for you here. An October 1941 article in the St. Catherine Standard documented some of the families that had already moved into the Victoria Park neighborhood in a series of photographs. The caption to these images you see here reads in part, of 325 wartime housing limited single family housing units scheduled for completion between now and early spring, 115 of the 133 erected in Victoria Park subdivision are already occupied by families from various parts of Canada. 
June Sleeth and Barbara Churchill, Jean Douglas and Frida Churchill engage in rope skipping, while Joan Richardson looks on from a Johnson Avenue doorstep. Two homey scenes at the rear of Longfellow Avenue, hanging clothes out to dry and chopping wood in the background. Mrs. Frank Churchill knitting, knitting in the comfortable knitting in the comfortable living room of her Johnson Street home while her son, Bud, relaxes as he awaits a call from the Royal Canadian Navy, end quote. These homes, equipped with utilities and amenities and well-spaced apart on even grids of street, offered families their own space to relax, play, and spend quality time and breathe. The homes owned by the government were affordable. High quality standard, higher quality standards of living would inevitably lead to higher production and efficiency in factories. As evidence in these photos, these neighborhoods became points of pride for Canadians during the war and even landmarks. Now, most interestingly of all, to me at least, these homes built under the Wartime Housing Limited were all meant to be temporary. That the houses were built on top of posts and constructed in sections bolted together were for easy disassembly after the war, when, when more effort could be made towards building permanent housing. The government had even pledged that they'd remove the homes at the start of the project back in 1941. However, after the Second World War had ended, the demand for adequate housing continued across Canada, as now veterans were returning home and looking for a place to live. So the housing initially built as a temporary solution for wartime manufacturing workers now became the permanent solution for returning veterans. The government provided financial aid to help veterans and their families purchase the homes in these neighborhoods. The families then might eventually reinforce the foundations of these prefabricated homes, add basements, or make more permanent improvements themselves. Take a walk in these distinct neighborhoods today, and you can tell which houses were opted not to be rebuilt with a basement. Now, efforts to reintegrate the some 900,000 men and women who served in the Second World War helps to foster the rapid suburbanization of Canada's population in the post-war years. This takes me to my, my next case study, my final case study of post-war suburbanization. Suburbanization. <laughs> The financial aid for housing that I just mentioned earlier came in the form of the creation of the Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation in 1946. Wartime Housing Limited and its myriad of properties were absorbed into this, federal, this new federal organization. The CMHC assisted Canadians with their first home purchase, as well as renovation projects that could now utilize essential materials no longer reserved for the war effort. Often, wartime housing tenants or returning veterans used CMHC to purchase their homes, um, to purchase the homes in these distinct neighborhoods. It's thought that about 30,000 victory homes were sold in this program. Unfortunately, this does mean that rather than reserving wartime housing's massive stock of affordable housing across Canada for lower income families, the federal government chose to instead privatize the homes and sell them off. This market-oriented approach greatly hindered social housing policy in Canada for decades. And Canadians still feel this impact today. 
Wartime Housing Limited continued to build housing, now more permanent, until about 1947. Notice how this wartime housing plan from 1947 um, is pretty identical in design to the quintessential victory house, uh, but it does advertise a full basement in this one. Uh, furthermore, oh, I lost my, my spot here. Wartime housing blueprints would also um, influence a whole generation of builders and developers. It's thought that a total of four or 46,000 wartime housing homes were built across Canada between 1941 and 1947. The massive migration of people into new suburban housing developments in the post-war era was a result of not only the mass demobilization after the war, both those who served and those in industry, and continued government involvement in housing, but also the expansion of the middle class, the popularization of the automobile, not just for wealthy industrialists anymore, the baby boom, and other dramatic changes in demographics. In St. Catharines, the result of post-war suburbanization is most acute in the development of North End St. Catharines. Take a look at this 1966 map of St. Catharines, which documents existing land use in the city. If we move a little closer to, uh, to a subsection of the North End in 1966, uh, we see a return of the winding streets of Glenridge in 1913, and neighborhoods are again being erected away from the city center. The economic boom of the post-war period enabled more families to be able to afford a car, and without the pressures of enhancing wartime production, there was no longer a necessity to live where you worked. In fact, new residential neighborhoods were being built in the 1950s and 1960s with, were designed with the car in mind. A closer look at uh, this land use map that we see here reveals a whole residential neighborhoods built in isolation from commercial areas. New zoning bylaws had actually forbid businesses from opening in residential sections. On the map here, I've circled what was um, zoned as commercial land use uh, with this map. Without the corner store, without public transit options, um, relegating these to the main streets and pedestrianism discouraged by distance, families were now expected to drive their own vehicle for necessity. Again, let's revisit the development of the Yates Street District or Western Hill in contrast to the speed in which these neighborhoods were being erected from the ground up. Similar to the 1913 plans for Glenridge, the design of these post-war suburbs was meant to influence a certain kind of lifestyle. And consequently, a certain type of people were meant to live here. Unlike the older neighborhoods of St. Catharines that were built over time and with several different cultural and social influences. With the downtown no longer the hub for community shopping and socializing, where would these families now do their errands? The newly erected shopping strips and shopping mall of course, with their sprawling parking lots. This here is a photograph of the exterior, exterior of Fairview Mall, uh, which opened in 1961, just north of the QEW nearing Geneva and Lake. Um, Fairview Mall 
had the express purpose of serving the growing populations moving to the outskirts of the city centre. Fairview was one of the first enclosed malls in Canada. Commercial shopping strips also began to emerge along several arterial streets north of the QEW, including Scott Street, Welland Avenue, and Lake Street. Such strips were built at main junctions with direct access to the highway, easily reached by car or bus, and were set back from the road frontage to allow for an abundance of space for parked vehicles. Now, as an aside, this land use map was drawn a mere five years after the 1961 amalgamation of Grantham, Portaluzzi, and Meriton into St. Catharines, a major reorganization necessary in part due to the mushrooming population growth and subsequent growth of, in residential development in the post-war era. From the map, we can clearly see the density of the city's urban core and its sprawl outwards, creeping towards the outskirts of the city. We're gonna fast forward again. Now for one more aside, the first major shopping center in St. Catharines was actually opened in 1957 on land that had been only recently annexed from Meriton to serve St. Catharines ballooning population. The Penn Center, first an open air shopping plaza, not only served those migrating to the new subdivisions being built at the southern end of the city, but also attracted motorists from across Niagara as a premier regional shopping centers. Out of town shoppers to the Penn Center would only increase after the opening of Highway 406 in 1965. The expansion of St. Catherine suburbs did come at a significant expense. As St. Catherine's population moved outward, so did the commercial businesses of downtown. Small outlets for grocery, fruits and vegetables, meat and poultry were eventually closed. The supermarkets that first found a home downtown like a and Food Store on St. Paul Street and Loblaws on Queen Street also closed in the late 1960s and relocated to the shopping plazas. Department stores too transferred to the suburbs. In 1961, Wright House opened at Fairview Mall and Robinson's, Eaton, Simpson, Sears and Zellers located to the Penn Center. With more population, with more of St. Catherine's population keeping to the suburbs to shop at large chain stores, specialized family operated stores downtown eventually declined. Movie theaters, of which there are about five operating downtown at its peak, were also forced to close by the end of the 1960s after famous players which had a theater at the corner of St. Paul and Carlisle, uh, made the exodus to a new two-theater cinema at the Penn Center. What was once a lively hub of commerce and entertainment in the community was now seemingly gutted. The detrimental impact of suburban growth that suburban growth had on the urban downtown centers was sadly a trend seen across Canada and the United States. Suburbs built to accommodate an ever growing population were deficient in culture and community that had thrived in old downtown cores. Though these neighborhoods had parks, schools, and maybe even a rink or pool, it was rare to find an art gallery, performance space, or any real public space for community gathering. That is not to say that these spaces did not exist, as actually the post-war era did bring a cultural awakening of sorts to St. Catharines in the formation of new arts associations, community concert series, lecture series, and community theater. However, these spaces were not located in these new subdivisions folks were again expected to drive 
outside, a distance away to find entertainment and community. As a consequence, post-war suburbanization saw whole neighborhoods turn inward as the adults drove a distance for work and entertainment and families receded into their living rooms when at home. Community belonging and identity suffered as a result. In lieu of a natural village center in most suburbs, the shopping mall emerged as the de facto focal point for social interaction. Teenagers, for example, would eventually stop meeting at Diana Suites and start gathering at the Penn or Fairview. Consumerism then was encouraged by the lack of other possible sites of community contact. Post-war suburbanization also revealed a contradiction. As more families sought the open air and open space of the suburbs, more green space was raised and developed to accommodate more homes. Furthermore, with, the, with more cars on the road, the more traffic became an issue and air pollution thickened, negatively impacting health. Existing roadways were subsequently widened to increase car capacity and new highways were built. In St. Catharines, we see this trend with the construction of Highway 406, which began in 1963. The barrier created by the Valley of Twelve Mile Creek, the bones that quite literally shaped how St. Catharines grew and developed since its first white settlers in the 1790s, the bones here were finally fully overcome with the arrival of the 406. The old canal valley was drained and the highway built right over top, curving in the same S shape, so historically quintessential to downtown St. Catharines. In the 1980s, Geneva Street and Ontario Street and Westchester Avenue were extended to, across, to cross the valley in addition to the Burgoyne Bridge. In all of my researching and digging and exploring and analyzing as I tried to make sense of the very large topic encompassing housing and development in St. Catharines, I kept returning to the same thought. These are all people's homes. The neighborhoods I've talked about today still stand, each with their own distinct identity and character. And most of the houses that help to cultivate these still stand too. In exploring specific societal trends that shape settlement patterns in St. Catharines tonight, from early industrialization to post-war suburbanization, I am struck by the cyclical ebb and flow that influences where people live the circumstances and considerations that go into this decision today are similar to what we've been able to trace throughout St. Catherine's history. Proximity to work and school, ease of transportation, access to shopping and, and amenities, proliferation of recreation and leisure, public spaces, art and culture, parks, trails, entertainment, community membership, and a sense of belonging. The trends that shaped the way people lived through the 19th and 20th centuries influenced not only their access to the above, but also what they valued over others. And this will continue to change as how we live in our city evolves and our relationship to our communities shift. It's a constant ebb and flow. So I'd like to conclude tonight's talk by revisiting the thought exercise I had you consider at the start. Think about where you currently live. What larger societal trends brought you to where you now call home? Does it embody the values you've come to cherish? Where do you hold community? Where do you feel like you belong? 
Do you find these outside of your home or neighborhood or are you content exactly where you are right at home? Thank you, everyone. That's it for my very long and explorating, explorative talk on housing and development, not nearly over, but a good start, I'd like to say. <laughs> I was going to say, you're giving me a run for my money on the longest lecture. I think I still have the record, still have the longest lecture crown, but you're very <laughs> close. You're very close, Sarah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a wonderful presentation. It was really nice to hear about our homes both literally and figuratively as a community tonight. Thank you so much. If you have any questions or comments for Sarah, please post them in the chat box now. It's getting late. So if you've got questions, get them right in that chat box and we'll get to them as soon as uh, I'm done talking. Okay, while we wait for those questions and comments, thank you very much to our viewers for attending tonight's lecture and for all of your support this season uh, and throughout the last three seasons now the virtual museum lecture series. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please consider making a donation to the museum so we can continue to provide the high quality and enjoyable programming that you have come to expect from us. To make a donation, please call the museum during our operating hours, 905-984-8880. And again, new this fall, you can make a donation online via our ActiveNet portal. The link to the portal was included in your email reminder this evening your donation makes a difference. It really does. Thank you. With our wonderful guests, we've now uh, delivered, as I mentioned before, 28, 29 lectures. Excellent. Well done, Sarah. 29 lectures. Uh, check out the playlist of our previous lectures on YouTube uh, or catch the audio on our now uh, special podcast, VMLS via podcast. I think there's seven episodes up now. We'd also like to remind everyone to please like, follow, share, subscribe on all our social media channels, including here on YouTube, WordPress, and our podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Speaking of WordPress, I have a lecture, uh, not a lecture, a blog series out right now, uh, which I'm not going to do as a lecture, but it's kind of similar to the lecture that I gave about the Welland Canal in 1830. It's all about how we tell the story of the first Welland Canal. So definitely tune into that. There's two posts out now and two posts coming out uh the next two saturdays uh but if you're not following us on wordpress you'll miss it so definitely follow us on wordpress please uh so that's just an example of all the different types of content that we spread across our platforms uh so definitely join in for some more historical adventures we'll see you next time on november 30th for kathleen's presentation when the world changed st catherine's and the first world war uh, the Virtual Museum Lecture Series is produced by the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Centre and presented by the City of St. Catharines. And now we'll take some questions. There are a few questions, Sarah. Isn't this exciting? I'm just going to stop. You just get to see our faces. And you might have to share your maps in case the questions need it. All right. Um, first question, is there a list of wartime housing in St. Catharines? Would like to know if 8 Kent Street was part of the government program. And that's very specific. You answer the first part and I'll answer the second part. <laughs> um, I guess it depends where uh, where Kent Street is. I'm not sure if I know that off the top of it's my head. Western Hill. Western Hill. If, I, if, I, if my memory serves correctly. So then possibly. I'm like uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, wartime housing was specifically built up in close proximity to industries. And if Western Hill is historically an industrial area in St. Catharines, and if there were industries um, operating during, during the Second World War and producing for the war, then there might have been a neighborhood there. In the uh, in the, the standard, they really focused on Victoria Park, so by GM, and the Queen Elizabeth Park um, by that Welland Avenue near Grantham Avenue area. Yeah, because those were like, actual full multi-street developments yes whereas uh yeah Kent, it can um uh i cover a little bit of kent street and western hill in my dead end streets lecture actually so there might be trying to think back to if i talked about the development there if i was just into the streets but um it's as you mentioned sarah it's completely it's totally possible that individuals may have bought plans that looked like wartime housing um, between 1941 and 1947 and was built in that in mm -hmm. that 
at that address. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing I should note is that if, yes, perfect, he says Western Hill, or she says Western Hill, sorry, uh, whoever, they say Western Hill. Uh, the um, uh, one thing I want to note, though, is that if you do have a specific question about your property, uh, we can help with that. Uh, our, re our research staff here at the museum can help with that. We do have access to land records, and so it would be possible to know uh, who the land was bought from and perhaps who uh, who built the house if we have that information. Uh, for example, if it was bought from the Canada wartime housing, whatever mm -hmm. the company is called, I forget. Um, and so you'll know right away if it's a wartime house or when at least when the structure was built. Uh, so do send us an email, uh, museumcollections at stcatherines.ca. Um, and while Sarah's answering the next question, I will put that address in the uh, chat box. Definitely send us an email. We can help start at least uh, yes. your research project on your home. It's really, really cool to know where your house came from. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, totally possible that your house is a wartime house. It's just perhaps maybe not as a multi-street wartime house development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, there was 325 built in St. Catharines, and the Victoria Park and Queen Elizabeth is about 250 of those houses. So there's definitely more um, more in St. Catharines. Um, so yeah, we'd love to, to research that out for you. Thank you. Lots of memories. <laughs> There's more, oh. <laughs> many other questions. Uh, but I love really, memories. Really, really great memories. Um, one is, um, uh, qu uh, quote, this isn't me, but quote, when I was a little girl, Pret Homes had a zoo and unable to find any info on. Um, yeah, Pret Homes out in sort of uh, West St. Catharines, actually into Lincoln. Um, yeah, definitely had a interesting series of development history. Uh, that's not really our department because it's outside of the uh, city of St. Catharines, uh, but definitely had a lot of different types of um, dreamy type of development. Yeah, that's dream, dreamy, like a zoo and like, you know, park space and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, okay, cool. Um, uh, Kathy also says, yeah, just confirming, Kathy says, uh, you could buy kit homes that looked very much the same as later wartime houses for sure. So yeah, the thing about like wartime houses is that, you know, if it's not like salaries exploded in 1945, uh, mm -hmm. 1946. So people were still likely making similar amounts of money if they were trying to live in that neighborhood. And mm -hmm. so you might build a similar looking house that was built the year before, uh, especially because as, yeah, as you mentioned in your talk, Sarah, there's a, um, a catalog that you can just order from. Yes, yes, especially what was um, the wartime housing uh, enabled prefabricated housing um, to be developed. So it was more accessible for people to literally, quite literally order from a catalog. The Sears catalog, for example, there's a lot of great ones. Um, Hands online. up if you grew up in a house <laughs> was from a catalog. <laughs> uh, but it made housing more, more accessible for a whole new generation of, of working class people that otherwise couldn't afford it. So yeah, for sure. Um, one thing that I noticed there was that what's really interesting when we were looking at some of the fire insurance plans, it kind of hit me a little bit, especially with uh, Queen Elizabeth Park development, that not a lot has changed. And in fact, those neighborhoods have pretty much, I mean, industry has come and gone in terms of occupying the land or running the actual buildings, but not a lot has actually changed uh, on street level compared to other neighborhoods. Uh, so it's interesting that the most, what was supposed to be, and you mentioned this in your talk, what was supposed to be the most temporary mm -hmm. housing mm -hmm. in the history of the city Mm -hmm. has turned out to be actually <laughs> the most unchangeable neighborhoods in the city. Yeah. Uh, they really haven't changed very much at all. Uh, so that's really, in terms of street, uh, in terms of, you know, the actual houses themselves, probably mm -hmm. maybe even some of the families who live there, maybe some of the same families now we're into multi-generational mm -hmm. uh, families. But if you look at the Glenridge neighborhood, the 406, as you mentioned, kind of cut off some of that city beautiful as the, the, the curvy end of Glenridge had to be redeveloped to accommodate Highway 406. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, really, really cool talk. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Oh, Kathy also says, <laughs> just to wrap up our Fred Holmes <laughs> tangent. <laughs> uh, Fred Holmes also had a miniature village. Yeah, super cool. Um, yes, very popular at one time. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we will see you on November 30th for uh, Kathleen's lecture on the First World War. But also don't forget, also uh, Kathleen's lecture is very exciting, of course. <laughs> Of course Everyone it is. Participate. <laughs> However, uh, don't forget that we will also be announcing mm -hmm. the winter 2022 lecture lineup. 